Even though they may not look like it at first glance, aircraft are crammed full of computers. Communications, navigation, monitoring, flight control, fuel, collision avoidance, flight recorders, weather systems, and management systems are all rooted in digital components. Military aircraft have even more. Because aircraft run complicated software and contain many digital interfaces, aircraft cybersecurity has become an increasingly important topic. In this show, special guest Brian McCord discusses just how embedded digital components are into modern aircraft, what cybersecurity threats exist, and how a researcher goes about discovering cybersecurity issues in an aircraft. Brian McCord has a background in developing cyber capabilities and planning offensive cyber operations for the U.S. military and beyond. He helps bring the hacker mindset to bear as vice president of labs at Shift 5. Brian, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Josh. Great to be here. Yeah. Um, well, this is a really exciting topic because, you know, as, as both of us know from spending so much time in, in the military, um, all these fleet assets have dozens and dozens and dozens of digital components. And in an aircraft, they're probably, you know, I would say based on seeing a bunch of these things, they're probably the assets that have the most embedded digital components on them when you compare them to even maritime vessels or or ground vehicles. And um, I, I don't know, there's this article that came out in, in Wired uh, ba uh, back in December that uh, described a up until then classified program uh, for the F-14 Tomcat, which um, kind of shook up a little bit of computing history because uh, up until this program got declassified, as far as we knew, the uh, the first microcontroller was uh, was an Intel four uh, four thousand four uh, developed in you know nineteen seventy one for use in like a calculator. Um, but in fact, uh, the Air Force made the first microcontroller uh, several uh, months or years before that for the F-14 Tomcat, <laughs> which um, is not a pocket calculator. And uh, I, I think it was it was to keep the the sort of the control surfaces on the on the aircraft um, in the proper configurations when it was in supersonic flight. But it just like it goes to show you just how deeply these these digital components are are embedded in a just inextricable way. Uh, with 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 military aircraft and civilian aircraft. Yeah, and I think um, they identified that as early as you were saying. I mean, that was what probably like the '70s when the F-14 was really becoming in development. And uh, I think yeah, 1971 or so is when the 4004 came out. And so the thinking was that like, look, at the end of the day, computers are more precise than people. And like, there's a lot of calculations that need to happen in order to do some really interesting things. Like if you're trying to make tight turns in an aircraft, you actually want the plane to be just unstable enough to quickly turn, but also not too unstable so that you don't just spiral downwards towards the ground, right? And the computer is what's sitting between the pilot and their death on the ground that's helping keep that plane in just the right way, injecting just the right amount of fuel, turning just the right amount. And of course, as we go to more and more unstable airframe designs to get that maneuverability with like these Gen 5, Gen 6 fighters, uh, those computers become more and more important. And they are feeding data from more and more resources. And honestly, like I'm not an expert in the history of the first microprocessors, but I think that's why they started looking at them is they're like, look, we have all these sensors all over that we need to be taking in that data, making smart calculations and taking burdens off the pilot, right? Like the days of being able to kind of feel out exactly what right looks like become harder and harder as you've got all these different things that need to be calculated for simultaneously. And that's what these airspeed sensors, these mock sensors, these uh, digital horizons, and like all these different things are coming together and merging with other systems like the navigation systems. You know, if you have GPS, it's telling you exactly where you're at. You have inertial navigation to tell you exactly where you're going and try to make up for any lost GPS signals. You've got, um, you know, now you've got actual controls controlling the wings digitally and like the control services sometimes. You got so many things going on at once uh, that it's hard for the pilot to put in manual input for that many systems at once, even with a co-pilot. And uh, we've become very dependent on computers 
And I don't think people realize to some degree how dependent we are and what that really means for like the cybersecurity of a vehicle. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think we started incorporating all these digital components because, I mean, at the end of the day, a fighter, you know, the way you're going to win air to air combat is like having overmatched power. Right. And so if you're able to turn uh, more quickly or you're able to sense data more quickly or you're able to thrust more quickly, you can overmatch your opponent. And so because digital components offer so many advantages that you were describing, we've just added more and more and more and more of these things to the point where now like the MQ-9 <laughs> drone doesn't even have a pilot in it. You know, it's, it's all it's all electronic. Um, but that brings up a good point where I think you were you were sort of taking it is, well, we started with these digital components, the aircraft was very isolated, you know, there's no real inputs and outputs besides like physical data. And we've gotten to the point now where there are, you know, the F-35 generates like, was it 10 terabytes of data per flight or some just like absurd amount of data. We have, you know, like inputs and outputs to this thing. I mean, I think if I remember correctly, Lockheed Martin had touted the F-35 as like a supercomputer in the sky that could route traffic, you know, among the, you know, among, so, 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 you know, intercommunication is the point. It's a, it's a feature, not a bug of these, of these, of these systems. And so, you know, you're in an environment now where there's, there's constant interaction at a digital level with this aircraft that now is just like, it's fundamentally a computer network. And so, um, where have we seen this before? We've seen in, you know, the IT world that when you network these computers that maybe weren't designed for cybersecurity from first principles, and then you start making them more and more and more interconnected. You know, ARPANET becomes the internet, and now you've got you know a bunch of bored you know b- bored teenagers that are um, you know p- poking and prodding at different machines that are that are hanging out there. You end up with a lot of really significant security concerns, and um, you know I thought it would be kind of an interesting. Uh, chat to have decomposing these these assets, uh, you know, commercial and military. It doesn't really matter. They're they're designed in very similar ways, um, but decomposing them to understand like how are these things from a digital perspective architected, and uh, you know what are you know as as a as a career penetration tester now well now manager of penetration testers, um, you know how how do you how do you folks like think about aircraft as digital landscapes and and what what is the what does the terrain look like right and so there's a, a couple of things to think about the first that every aircraft is kind of unique and so there's a lot of things that rhyme in between different platforms but they're not always the exact same so the first step we take is the laborious one of you know when we engage with an aircraft we usually read somewhere between four and six thousand pages of documentation whenever we can get it and become experts on the platform then you have to kind of understand uh where chronologically you're sitting. Because remember, aircraft come from a fully mechanical system, right? If you're talking as far back as the Wright brothers, there is no computers on that. And as computer or aircraft evolved through World War II and into the commercial flight age and beyond, um, computers were added in later. And there's definitely fields where uh, some things are still fly by wire, is that they're like digital, and then there's like kind of fly by cabling where there's physical connections where like even if all the computer run parts turn off, there's physical ways of flying that aircraft with literal steel cables. And so you have to kind of understand where you are at the spectrum where maybe the F-35 almost completely fly by wire sits on one end and you know a Wright Brothers plane (laughs) where you're on a bicycle attached with chains is on the other. You gotta know where you are and that'll help you understand where to focus. And so there's normally a couple things going on in that, One, everyone understands that digital surfaces can mean potential vulnerabilities. Everyone kind of knows that, but here's how that really like turns out in our experience. One, a lot of the the digital stuff tends to get concentrated around the things that need to do computations, right? So at first that usually means uh, the avionics. So there's a lot of digital stuff going on in the avionics because the whole point of that system is to help the pilot fly the plane by taking in data from a lot of sensors, data from a lot of systems generating it like GPS or inertial navigation, and then pipe it out after computing on it in ways that help the pilot fly the plane. So you'll often find these like critical central points, like an avionics computer, 
where the system architects have decided to try to centralize all their computations so they don't need to distribute you know, processors, RAM, operating systems across, across a wide variety of devices. They can concentrate in one place and do as many calculations as possible as one spot and also do things like reduce the cabling to get to all the monitors and have one thing they have to swap out if something goes wrong rather than have to swap out every single device if there's some sort of wrong computation. Now, at the same time, uh, you'll notice a lot of redundant systems, right? And this is one reason why a lot of people believe that planes are unhackable, right? Is because, look, you've got all these different OEMs constantly, constantly looking at these aircraft systems, and they realize that these are safety critical, right? They're carrying people, they're carrying precious cargo, they're military aircraft that cannot fail. And so they build in redundant systems. Normally you have two or three of device X in case one is blown up or one shuts off or one gets struck by lightning, you have backups. Then you have whole teams of engineers whose whole job it is, is to literally walk the code path of every system they design and ensure that there's no corner case, no edge case, no nothing that in certain scenarios would fail and cause a failure of the aircraft. So they've spent a lot of times, like decades, looking at these avionic systems over and over and over and walking every code path and just trying to figure out, look, is there any way that this could fail and then deal for it? And so a lot of people look at that and say, like, these things have been so over-tested that there's literally no code path that's been looked at that could possibly fail because I trust these teams of engineers to look at it over and over. Um, when in reality, like these engineers are not necessarily like cybersecurity experts, right? They're not looking at it like someone might maliciously. And that causes them to really focus on the safety and redundancy features, which typically can enable logical flaws, right? So something, if I go at a system and say like, hey, I'm looking for vulnerabilities by straight up fuzzing it and guessing or looking for race conditions, it's going to be exponentially harder because there's a redundant system to solve that problem if you get lucky on the first system. But if you can find logical flaws with what's running on the software, uh, that becomes a much greater concern because they are consistently repeatable. So what I can do on the primary system, I can usually do in the backup system just as well. And if you can find something that hits 100% of the time, that's a problem. And so what we look for is like really trying to understand the code running on a lot of these devices at as deep a level as we can possibly get, whether that's looking at um, how it's running externally, you know, just watching the inputs and then seeing the outputs, or trying to dig into the actual firmware on the devices and understanding what is not only the architecture of the network, which usually is a pretty straightforward uh serial network of some kind, whether it's A-Ring 429 point to points or 1553 for like military aircraft. But how does that network interact with what's going on in the devices that allows you an interesting path that cause interesting effects? And I think um, that's, if you look hard enough, you'd be surprised at what's there because there's so many safety critical functions and because it is such a huge pain to get things certified that as soon as you got something that's working, no one wants to touch it. <laughs> and so you'll notice a lot of the programming techniques and literally the hardware itself uh, were designed in you know, the 70s, 80s, 90s, and no one has really seen need to touch it because then they got to recertify the whole thing over again. So a lot of old memory techniques like static memory addressing still exists. Uh, they're running real-time operating systems where you can quantifiably walk every code path, so they're very dead simple. Uh, so they're not doing a lot of dynamic checking or anything of inputs. And you'll find a lot of interesting like features of these code sets that are considered very uh, time-tested and proven, but that's because no one has messed with them as you know the vulnerability space has evolved. Yeah, they, they were designed for reliability and robustness in the physical world, but never with an eye for a witting adversary actively trying to subvert the devices on, on that serial network or on that, on that plane, right? Yeah, and really, like, especially in the Department of Defense space, you're running up against the new ways of thinking, right? In the new uh, military, right, the new Air Force, the new Army, the new uh, militaries around the world, uh, more sensors equal more better. Right. And so, uh, you know, you have the Air Force publicly releasing like, hey, not only do we want sensors all over our aircraft taking in every kind of data we can think of, 
but we want to share what that sensor data is, right? We want to use things like ABMS to share across the entire Air Force instant situational awareness, which is amazing from a warfighting perspective, but from a cybersecurity perspective, it provides some uh, interesting caveats because you have to understand in order to share information, I've got a link to other devices. Right. And the kind of the philosophical security foundation of a lot of these things when they were designed is they are air gapped networks. Nothing else is going to talk to my plane unless, you know, it's physically connected. That was kind of the original in the seventies idea. Like there's no other way, but now we're connecting all kinds of data link networks and other, like whether it's civilian or military or just like commercial generally available, um, all kinds of data is going on and off to aircraft now through satellites, through VHF radios, uh, even through like HF radios and other kind of uh, proprietary technologies, or even like small pro- like proprietary networks when you're sitting on the ground or in the air, is piping data on and off uh, that's got to interact with the vehicle somehow. And that's where you can get really interesting plays as you try to do more and more complicated things on the aircraft itself from something that is not the aircraft and that allows you some interesting data pipes. <laughs> yeah, let, let's take a maybe a high level accounting of some of those access vectors because I think that you know, one of the hurdles, the mental hurdles that folks need to get over when they're thinking about aircraft cybersecurity is they say, ah, these are closed systems or they're op- 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 opaque and obscure protocols that like no one is gonna be able to interact with an aircraft. Uh, and then you you sort of couple that with a couple of sensational and ultimately completely wrong assertions that you can like, for, for example, pivot from the infotainment system into like the the you know the avionics controls and like control an aircraft from the from the from the backseat of the aircraft. That's that is an unfounded concern because of the way these things are designed. <laughs> but but there are other very credible and serious um, potential uh, potential ways to get interaction with these critical subsystems, right? Right. And without getting too specific, um, I encourage the general audience to think about what's really happening, right? Is that you're most concerned about your cyber boundary and how data goes from the outside to the inside. So first, I would take a look at like all real obvious entry points. Like if you have a network connected, right? I'm a commercial airliner. I literally have internet piped into my plane through the satellite. That is clearly data entering my plane that wasn't there before. So I would want to take a look, right? And maybe, yes, maybe it's well isolated on just the infotainment. It's just piping uh, internet and movies to the people in the seats, and there's no way to bridge into the avionics system. Don't know. We'd have to check per aircraft. But I would also encourage people to check on things that you wouldn't normally think of as data. Because remember, there's so many sensors that all they're doing is they're taking outside stimulus, whether that's digital or analog, and then digitizing it to send that sensor input to the rest of the aircraft. And so even something like a weather radar could be considered a cyber entry point because, look, it's getting some sort of reflection back when it sends out that radar data. That analog stimulus is then likely digitized by whatever like line replaceable unit is running the weather radar software. And that digital output is then usually placed on a serial data bus line or maybe it's an Ethernet connection to some other point. And you are now transmitting data that is being processed by some code running somewhere. It's being put in memory somewhere. It's doing stuff. It's computing. It's cyber. And, you know, I would not overlook any single point where some stimulus on the outside of the aircraft is able to cause ones and zeros to fire on the inside of the aircraft no matter what protocol. And remember, there are some protocols that are required to be run. Some comms protocols, some protocols that the aircraft needs to emit, some protocols the aircraft needs to take in and talk to, that at least in the United States and in most places around the world are absolutely required to be legally flying an aircraft. So I would take close looks at those (laughs) and see how those actually interact with other critical cyber systems like you know, other compute resources on the airplane itself. Yeah, right. And, and and what's kind of disconcerting, not kind of very disconcerting about a lot of these protocols, you know, take GPS or um, ADSB, Aircraft Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. And, you know, these are protocols that um, 
you know, are transmitted over the RF spectrum. So, so you, you, you can paint an aircraft with one of these things from hundreds of miles away in some cases. Um, and the, because these things were designed in the 70s to be simple and work on very tiny, very like low power, uh, low CPU uh, devices, they're very simple protocols that don't have cryptographic security. They don't have any of the sort of basic transport layer kinds of security that we are that we've built in on the IT side to deal with man in the middle attacks and and, and folks that like are trying to transmit malicious traffic. So you can create a significant shell around an asset by putting cryptographic security on communications, right? But something like aircraft dependent surveillance broadcast, anybody can trans. I mean, you're gonna. Don't do this. Uh, the FC, FTC will probably come knocking at your door and be very upset. Uh, but you can, I mean, with with a few thousand dollars worth of equipment, transmit ADSB signals that will be consumed by aircraft and ground stations, right? I mean, how, how hard is that actually to do? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things to keep in mind is, one, always obey the rules and laws in your area. No excuses there. Uh, and two, we're not attorneys. We're uh, not attorneys. Yeah. <laughs> uh, two... Aircraft are trained to be friendly, right? Like you said, there's not really much of an idea of authentication. And although there are a lot of bodies looking at some of those problems right now, like how do we take common protocols and encrypt them? Or how do we take common protocols and enforce authentication so nobody can just yell at us? Right now, a lot of aircraft are very friendly, right? Anything that's talking the right language, it will talk back. And they do that by design, so that way you can you know, land at any airfield, you can talk with any other aircraft, you can call on emergency signals. Um, there's a lot of protocols on and off that aircraft that are expected to run a certain way. Um, additionally, all the data is there for those seeking it, right? I mean, you can go to websites where people are just sitting and passively collecting all kinds of protocol traffic by just setting up little dishes right next door to you know major airports and metropolitan areas. And there's literally hundreds of planes a day that are just dumping data onto these sensors. And you know mostly hobbyists are just collecting it to try to look at it, understand it. They can use it to track flights. They can use it to see what's going on at an airport. They can use it to try to reverse out the protocol itself, right? Not to mention that a lot of these protocols are commercially available. And sometimes you can spend just a few hundred dollars and have a bit for bit breakdown of like, this is how an aircraft is talking, right? right. Uh, so that kind of, that other security model, right? That OEMs prefer, which is if my stuff is proprietary and I never talk about it, then the only people that can figure it out are those with special access, you know, like they're more worried about insider threats or more worried about people who bought some firmware in the black market. When in reality, I mean, with the average person's ability to do big data churn, with even just an average laptop, with the ability to use software-defined radios to gather information about how these planes are talking, uh, you know, with our ability to just hit the internet and like figure stuff out by Googling around, uh, that security kind of foundational knowledge is slowly eroding, and you've got to say, like, look, Somebody out there is smart enough to figure out how to do something bad. They may not know how to control it. They may not even know truly what caused it. But, uh, you know, you put enough monkeys in a room and eventually they're going to write Shakespeare, right? Right. And so the data is just so out there right now, whether companies like it or not, um, that given enough time, somebody can figure it out. And the tools are just becoming more and more serious. <laughs> <laughs> they, they sure are. And it's not to mention that, like, uh, you know, you're not talking about some, sometimes you can just sort of do binary protocol reversing based on the, the data that you're collecting emanations in the air. Right. Like that. You can absolutely do that. There are plenty of examples of where we've taken a look at systems um, and been able to procure control units off of eBay, right? You can you can buy these <laughs> things on the Internet, like used sort of scrap parts things they have firmware on them. And if you like have, you know, a 101 in reverse engineering, we've actually, we had Rob Peasley uh, on the, on the, uh, an earlier episode talking about how to do reverse engineering of, of a, of a system like that, that you can procure on the internet. Right. Uh, or, or you have situations where you think physical control over the assets a given, and then, you know, you fast forward to 2021 
I mean, one salient example is our rush out of Afghanistan. There's a lot of military equipment that we gave to the Afghan National Forces that is now not in Afghan National Forces' hands anymore. And you better bet that there are potential adversaries lining up around the world to procure those uh, assets uh, and and pay top dollar so that they can decompose those systems and understand at a physical level, at a cyber level, where are the weaknesses here? So, so security through obscurity is fine as a, as a, as a control measure. Some, some would argue that it's not. It, you know, I, I think it's, it can be an effective part of, of control measure, keeping, you know, making it hard, just constantly putting friction in the process of trying, um, uh, you know, you know try, uh, of, of, of adversaries that are trying to subvert their, their system. That, that can be effective. It's just that it can't be the only thing. There have to be many other th- roadblocks that you put in the way um, to, to, to securing these systems. Um, which, which brings us to a, I, I kind of an interesting point. So, I mean, in the IT world, we, we've definitely seen examples of software, like the Windows operating system. God love it. That uh, has been around for a very long time, um, has code that is written by people that have long since retired, um, that's running, you know, billions of devices, the memory manager in the Windows kernel, for example, like, you know, that thing is, uh, I mean, a, a total Jenga tower, like, um, you know, it, it works. <laughs> but I'm sure, you know, you get um, someone to stare at that thing long enough, you're going to find issues, right? And so we're constantly patching these things. One of the encouraging things on the IT side is that IT assets, things like servers, cell phones, laptops, network gear, we tend to retire those in um, relatively quick cycles, right? Like a, a cell phone, you might have for a couple of years, a laptop, maybe four years, a server, maybe five to seven years. Something like an aircraft, though, I mean, these are very expensive, multi-million dollar assets. Um, you're going to put them in service for a very long time. You know, look at, I mean, an extreme example, but uh, look at the B-52, right? I mean, the thing, they're they're overhauling the engines on it. It's going to be in service for over 100 years. Like, I, 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 I guarantee it, right? And so... Um, you know, I think uh, when you when you couple the uh, just the, the the longevity of these things with the, the you know the engineering problems that we face, the the question becomes: Well, first off, could we redesign these systems with from first principles with cybersecurity protocols in mind that would mitigate maybe a lot of the the issues that we have? Maybe we, maybe we start with with that question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, great question. So. Uh, a couple things in decomposing my thought process here. One, if you own a platform, whether it's the government, you know, with like fighter aircraft, or it's uh, a car company with a fleet of vehicles that they've been designing, it is hard to go backwards, right? If you've already designed it, you've already built a factory around it, you're already pumping out thousands of these units every year, you're already selling it to customers, the government, for tens of millions or billions of dollars. Um, it's hard to stop all that works, right? And then go back, readjust a lot of things and come out with model number two, right? That's, it's a non-trivial event. And so, uh, most, you know, clients we've run into are like, it's really not a feasible option for me to go back and try to basically design a new vehicle and then replace all the old vehicles with the new vehicles. That's just cost prohibitive. It doesn't make sense. So whenever you're thinking about a cybersecurity solution, in this case, like in the avionics space or the aviation space, um, you've got to think of one that can be backwards compatible with what has already been done because it's cost prohibitive to go in and create something new. And um, that doesn't mean that I discourage people from starting at the baseline and redesigning systems when they have a chance, right? So, you know, as, for example, the U.S. gets onto its next generation of fighters or as a commercial company thinks about the next model of car or train or whatever, um, I think it's a very wise decision to go back and say, okay, this is how we had to architect it before. How can we architect it in the future to add things that we know work in other spaces, right? How can we have network segmentation so that you can't bridge from certain functions to other functions? How can we do partitioning or hypervisor virtualization, right? Where you have a minimum amount of permissions on a small, small surface and then have them all interacting in a way that like keeps your safety at a maximum. Because like you mentioned, um, you have to assume that somebody's going to be able to examine your system closely eventually. 
If you're a car manufacturer, you're going to sell one of those things. Somebody can buy it and start ripping it apart, right? If you're a plane manufacturer, uh, somebody's eventually going to buy one and you can find parts on eBay. We've done that <laughs> or other sources, right? Somebody can take a look. And, you know, even if you're the federal government with export control devices, like you said, uh, right now, the Taliban is in charge of a number of Black Hawk helicopters, amongst other things, right? And so who knows who gets a chance to take a real close look at those and catch up on all the things they miss that are not on the open market. So while I encourage companies like, I don't blame them for trying to have security through obscurity and make proprietary one of their security baselines. Um, that is part of a smart defense in depth. It is not the only solution to the problem because the beauty of being an attacker is you only have to be right once. And so you only need that system to falter once in some minor way and that gives you an access road in and you don't want the underbelly past that defensive layer to be soft. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I mean, one of the ways that we try to take um, a system that is otherwise in successful service uh, and go back and fix these just massive latent cybersecurity threats um, is through defense in depth. It's intrusion detection and intrusion prevention, right? What are some of the ways, knowing what you do about all the different architectures that you find in aircraft. Like what are some of the ways that you, you go and take a system that has safety critical assets on it that you, you just can't, um, you can't re-engineer, you can't add cryptographic security, you can't fundamentally change communication protocols. How do you put an intrusion detection system onto that asset? And then in what circumstances can you or should you do intrusion prevention? Right. So uh, to answer the first part of the question, you know, if you're thinking of this like a battle, right, like the defenders are battling the attackers, uh, whenever you're setting up a defense in battle, you want to know where is the attacker going to attack, right? So the first thing that we do is we do a full tip to tail risk assessment saying, hey, let me examine your system, figure out where the key cyber components are, and then how someone is likely to attempt to gain access. That way you know what to watch closely and what you need to understand best in order to defend against malicious actors, right? Uh, then the second thing you need to understand is that if you're lucky, you have a relatively simple system that because of the needs of certification and these safety critical like designs uh, only does have so many operations that it does, right? And there'll be things that are very regular, and you can use them as baselines to say, I understand what right is generally supposed to look like. Here's So what we do a lot at Shift 5 is we say, you know, we collect all the data we can, and then we use that to make good heuristical models and say, like, during takeoff, a plane will look something like this. During flight, a plane will look something like this. During landing, a plane's bus traffic looks something like this. And then we can be very specific about, like, hmm, this device seems to be doing things I don't understand or that seem odd or even I have signaturized as bad because we have done it ourselves and we're able to demonstrate that a device acting this way causes a problem for the aircraft. And then you can start to do that intrusion detection. Now, in general, we have been very uh, willing to do intrusion detection because uh, you can do that passively. Now, a big hurdle for like the aviation community is that people are on these things, right? Like kids are going to Disney World on these planes and like you don't want anything bad to happen to them. And so you have to be very careful about intrusion prevention or uh, another big topic in the area is how much load is put on the pilot, right? Like if I'm alerting on every single potential problem uh, that we think could be a cyber attack or could be a maintenance issue or could be anything, that pilot's already got enough to do flying the plane as is, just keeping this giant hunk of metal in the air. Um, and so we've really spent a lot of time trying to figure out what meets the threshold of notification and who needs to get notified. Is it the pilot? Is it the maintainer after the plane lands? Is it uh, somebody down the road, like a cyber team forensic investigator, when they collect that data once every thousand flight hours, they can go back and figure it out? Um, that has a lot to do with each customer has kind of their own specs of what they want. But I think intrusion, detect intrusion detection at the network level, like we've been doing, 
is just as possible as it is on any other you know Ethernet network, right? If you have 100% of the traffic, you understand what the traffic is and is supposed to be on a like good flight in most conditions, then you can hone in on what's different, and then you've got to have the art of uh, figuring out how serious is that difference, and then who needs to know about it. So it is definitely an art to figure out how not to freak out the pilots, um, to overload them, and then to uh, reduce to a minimum, you know, things like false positives. Like you don't want a commercial airline turning around and landing at the nearest airfield when in fact nothing was wrong because that's going to delay flights, it's going to cost money, it's going to be problems. You don't want a military aircraft uh, turning around because they think they're under cyber attack when their mission was critical for the safety of people on the ground or something like that. Um, and so we have spent a lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears trying to figure out what is the best way to engage those less science more artful problems of getting it just right uh, for being serious, trying to catch stuff, without um, giving too much burden to the people that need to be flying that aircraft. It's such a new category, right? I mean, fleet cybersecurity, we've seen, obviously, IT cybersecurity has a rich tradition that spans decades at this point. Um, we've seen information uh, or uh, IoT devices, Internet of Things devices as a really important new category of device that, that people are starting to think about. Uh, OT cybersecurity has become a really big deal. Operational technology, things like uh, industrial control systems and SCADA systems that run water treatment facilities and manufacturing assembly lines and power plants. Um, fleets, things that move people and goods around uh, are, are kind of another new category. It's a new frontier of cybersecurity that we're dealing with. And I know that there there aren't a tremendous amount of resources out there for folks that want to learn more about this. But you know, if you're a security researcher listening, um, or you you are a you know information security professional, a CISO, or someone who's in charge of securing uh, infrastructure for for an operator of fleet assets, like where do you look to learn about this stuff and and start thinking about incorporating fleets into an overall information security program? Yeah, so I'd say the first step is you need to understand what your risk profile really is, right? So like for the professional in charge of fleet, you've got to understand what's actually on your fleets, right? You've got to understand what parts are computers, what parts are not, and then like what software those computers are running. Because you'll notice um, if you really watch like the security blogs and those sorts of things that there's a trend occurring, which is OEMs are getting smart and they're applying IT principles to OT platforms in that like, hey, if we can focus on down to a couple of different really well-tested, really feature-rich real-time operating systems, we can save ourselves time and money, we can have code reuse, we can have code modularity so we can keep the same baseline. And so as vulnerabilities are discovered in those like code bases or libraries, uh, you can have a huge variety of fleet assets, like not just many of the same type, but many types, even between like ground, air, land, sea, um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you can find these things. So, for example, I've been spending some time today reading up on the bad ALEC vulnerability. So this is a vulnerability published, I think, like seven days ago, around 17 August of 21, uh, where a Microsoft team found... Uh, some flaws in a C library inside of the BlackBerry QNIX operating system. You can find this not only on you know potential uh, aviation assets like we're talking about here, but you can find it on medical devices. You find it on a bunch of cars. You can find it on industrial control systems. And these researchers discovering this one flaw have now put uh, high estimates range in like the 175 million vehicle mark, right? And so how is somebody in charge of every car coming off the assembly line at Ford going to be like, you know, hey, somebody found a cybersecurity vulnerability that's been caked into projects since as late as 2012. Um, what do I do about that, right? And if you don't have any sort of baseline about what your risk profile is, what you're even running on your own vehicles, you might just, out of naivety or ignorance, like assume you don't have a problem, right? Like, oh, yeah, I think we have some BlackBerry stuff, but I'm sure they'll take care of it. 
uh, you don't even know what you're running, right? So you got to know what you have, and then you got to know what to do about it if you find something wrong. So is that something where you can you recall every single Ford vehicle and have a firmware update, you know, in your infotainment system? I doubt it. You could, but that's a business risk you got to calculate. So what can you put in your vehicles beforehand to make sure that if these things do pop up, you've got immediate response actions that don't right. require you to either re-engineer an entire vehicle, recall an entire fleet, or do something crazy like, I don't want to be the general who has to tell the president I've got to ground every single bomber in his like in his right. suites because of this potential cyber vulnerability, right? You've yep. got to have things you can do. Uh, to detect it beforehand and then respond to it afterwards. Um, otherwise, it's a matter of time before a problem shows up for you. Yeah, it's a tough job. It's a tough job. Um, awesome. Well, Brian, <laughs> thank you so much. House, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I don't have to worry let's, about this problem. Let, let's, <laughs> let's make some tools for, for, for the folks that are doing the dirty work. You know? um, awesome. Well, Brian, it was great to have you on the show, and uh, I hope to have you on again really soon. Thanks, Josh. Glad to be here. Thank you for listening to this episode of Planes, Trains, and Tanks. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review. To learn more about Shift 5 and our products, visit our website at shift5.io or follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter.